On today's schedule, uh, the first thing that I'm, we're going to talk about is creating a successful photography portfolio. Okay, so as photographers, you know we can go and do many shoots. We can choose to hide the things that didn't turn out so good, right? And we can display only the best stuff. So we're going to talk about um, the things that I've learned over the years, uh, which make a good photography portfolio. Okay. Um, after that, Chase Jarvis is going to join me, and we're going to have a little kind of banter, open chat, um, talk about the industry, uh, where things are going from our perspectives. Um, after that, I have a keynote about how I interpret light in images. So I think um, the most useful skill that a photographer can learn is learn how to dissect images and dissect the lighting from them so they can kind of pick and choose the things they like about that image and reapply it to their own images later. So your style can kind of be made up of everything you like about the things that you experience and look at in film or in other photographers' work. You can take that and apply it uh, to your own work to get something you, uh, new, original, and unique, okay? Um, after that keynote, since we're gonna know how to define things, then I can do an actual demonstration here uh, in the Creative Life Studio using what we learned, okay? Um, so the first thing, what makes a good portfolio, okay? Before we go into portfolio, let's define what I'm talking about first. So, a, okay, everyone's getting their nose, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> what is a portfolio? <laughs> All right, so, uh, a portfolio is your collection of best images, okay? Whether you choose to display these in a printed book or whether you display them on a website, I'm still talking about a portfolio, okay? It's any means necessary of showing people what exactly it is that you do. Now, I think the most important principle uh, when I talk about putting together your work is obviously only showing strongest images. So if you're like me, uh, you do a shoot and you kind of fall in love with the pictures, right? You're like, don't want to get away. You're like a king hoarding gold. You're like, no, no, no. And then over time, you start to realize that people and yourself are gravitating toward certain images from that shoot, right? So for me, what takes up the majority of my time and like what keeps me awake at night wondering is the selection process, okay? So in my portfolio, I'm only choosing the strongest images to show. So I'm Xing out all the other stuff and I can still choose if it's on a website to show it in a different gallery, but in my portfolio, I wanna maybe show like three or four images from a shoot max. In my entire main base portfolio, um, I'm taking only about 40 to 60 images. That's it. The rest can be locked away in other galleries as reference. Uh, if someone sees the quick version of your portfolio and wants to see things afterward, they can always access those in different uh, parts of the website. But just the main highlight section, I recommend 40 to 60 images of just your best work. Um, so let's look at this slide of a shoot that I did for Rebel Inc. magazine, uh, photographing a guy named Rico the Zombie, Zombie Boy. Uh, you might recognize him some from uh, Lady Gaga music videos or that commercial on YouTube where they, they put makeup on him to make it look like he's not tattooed. Um, he's a performance artist, really interesting guy um, that I had the opportunity to photograph uh, for the cover of Rebel Inc., as I was saying. So, during the day, we got a lot of different stuff, like every single picture you take of this guy looks good. Um, but it was, what I had to do is kind of narrow it down to three images, right? So although we have a lot for the shoot, and I still did a blog post about that body of work, um, I only choose to display like the top three. So in my portfolio, this is the actual order that I'm using to display them is we start with a portrait, uh, just to show you know, his face. His, the most interesting feature, I think, is a skull face tattoo. Then we go to a wider shot, which shows, oh wow, he has his whole body covered in tattoos. And then the third thing I show is something a little bit more creative. So this is drawing off inspiration from Salvador Dali and Philip Halsman photo, where they make the nude human bodies make a human skull. That was the inspiration for the shoot, so I end on that in that small series uh, within my portfolio. Um, the thing to think about is I know a lot of photographers are in a rut and they like hate all their old work like I'm the same way like if a certain amount of months pass I'm like ugh, crap like get rid of it interesting thing to think about is if I'm saying only you know 40 to 60 images in a book let's say you're making your first portfolio and you want to include 40 pictures right and I'm choosing four images from one shoot what it really means is that you only need to set up 10 shoots 
to have a complete new body of work, right? Because really, as photographers, we don't have to show all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Anything that you've shot leading up to now, it's just may have been practice, right? Or might have been learning. So if you're not happy with anything you've done and you want to go out by yourself, you don't have any clients, you just set up 10 shoots. To me, as long as you're getting about three to four images, it's enough to build an entire new portfolio of work. So as I shoot, I'm actively getting rid of old stuff and putting in new stuff and keeping it fresh, only keeping the strongest stuff, okay? The other thing that I think is one of the main important things of a photography portfolio is to specialize. And this is where a lot of photographers go wrong, in my opinion, is there's so many different genres and so many different industries in photography that it makes sense to specialize and have a sort of cohesion with your work. So let me give you an example. Um, it's very rare uh, that you'll see a very successful portrait photographer also doing things like still life and also doing landscapes and like mixing it all together. Um, instead, they choose to specialize, especially in the beginning, so that they sort of have a brand and people know when they hire them what they're going to get. So if you have a portfolio that's like mix and match, this, 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 it's like, when I hire this guy, am I going to get this or am I going to get this? I don't really understand. If you had an eye problem, you wouldn't go to an ear doctor to fix it, right? So photographers also have to be specialists in this regard. I've said this before, but there are many different professions that drive automobiles and drive cars, but they're all separate professions. So what I suggest to people starting out when they're building their first portfolio uh, is to pick a subject matter that interests you or pick a style of shooting that interests you. Okay, And then you can pursue that exclusively, force, just to build kind of a look and a direction of where you're going. It doesn't mean that you have to stick doing that forever, but it'll certainly uh, help people understand what it is uh, that you do. The other important thing that I always talk about is happiness. So if you're going to really put years of your life into this, you're going to have to choose a subject matter that means something to you, a subject matter that like keeps you awake at night because you're so interested to shoot it. So for me, my own work, it's personal, right? It's, uh, I like to shoot portraits. Um, I like to work with people. I think it's uh, one of the most challenging things for me to do. I'm actually not a very good landscape photographer. Like I go to some of the most amazing countries and see like this and I'm like, oh, that looks great. <laughs> and like drive right by because I know I can never properly capture. Instead, I prefer uh, to focus on people and portrait. So although the subject matter in my portfolio is very vast, so maybe indigenous tribes in southern Ethiopia or even celebrity work, what I've been trying to draw toward is having a sort of unison of all this kind of like portrait style, right? So the way that I define my style is kind of a, a cinematic portrait on location. So these two examples here, although they're very different uh, in terms of lighting, uh, they're very different in terms of subject matter, they still kind of fit together, right? So when someone flips through my website or flips through my book, at least everything appears to come from the same hand, okay? So the other thing uh, that I will talk about is flow. So the portfolio, it should fit together like a good album, like a good collection of songs. I like to make this comparison because it's something that everyone understands, right? So when you listen to a good record and you listen to a good music album, it's very unlikely that they'll put the heaviest song right after like the slowest song, right? So when you establish the order of your portfolio, it can say a lot about you. Okay, and I'll explain what exactly that means. So for me, I know personally, I came from shooting a sort of different style than I'm shooting now. Um, and it was very difficult for me to kind of like merge the gap. And it still is today. Uh, every shoot that I uh, work on, um, I'm slowly kind of moving away from where I started and going in a more refined direction. But that doesn't mean that I can't display things and I have to get rid of everything. All I have to think about is flow and how I'm going to organize the images for how they appear when people experience the portfolio. Okay? So this could be either clicking through the gallery on the website or turning the pages in a book. If you have a certain style or a certain subject matter, uh, when you turn the page and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, how did this get here? It doesn't feel like it's from the same hand. To me, that distracts from the portfolio and it takes away from the work because it doesn't look like it all came from the same photographer. So if you follow my last point and want to become a specialist, flow can help that. So I can talk about it forever, but let me give you an example. 
Uh, if you look at my work here, uh, these are two different photo shoots that I've done. Uh, one is for Zombie Boy, like we saw before, and one is for from the TV show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Okay. Now, if you look at image one and image eight, they're starkly different from one another. If those were organized in my portfolio following each other, so you started with that portrait of Zombie Boy, number one, turn the page, and it was like all of a sudden number eight, to me that would feel like kind of jaunting, right, or kind of jarring, like, whoa, like a big, a big difference in both color scheme, uh, mood and feel. One is kind of serious, one is kind of silly, completely different color schemes. To me, that takes me out of the work, um, and it feels kind of like all over the place. So what I can do is sort of like establish a flow, okay, and an order in which I choose things so they lead into one another. So this is actually how they're displayed on my site right now and in my printed book right now. Is if you go to one, okay, we know the order of the zombie boy, one, two, three. And instead of going right to number eight, that light picture, I kind of started with like this darker individual portrait of Danny DeVito, which kind of matches the mood and the color tones of the image before it, right? If you go on to number five, it's like getting a little silly, like a little bit of uh, humor in, but it's still kind of like a similar feel, right? It's still kind of like similar tones. Number six, uh, it's getting even brighter. It's a little bit lighthearted, kind of like pose, like with his feet up on the bathtub, right? But he's still a member of the same cast. You saw him previously in number five. Number seven, we have another picture of Danny DeVito, which is like completely lighthearted, right? He's laughing like, ah, ha, 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 okay? That is an okay lead-in to number eight. So this order, flipping through it, doesn't quite feel um, as discombobulated than like having them in a different order. That's what I mean when I say flow, okay? The other thing uh, when talking about flow is displaying things in series. So I review a lot of people's portfolios, and um, by the way, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking all from like my personal experience because everyone's gonna be subjective and be like, no, that's not the way that I learned from so-and-so. So from my personal experience, I like to assemble the flow of my book in stories, okay? Because oftentimes, let's say I'm working for an ad client or working for an editorial magazine, is there's usually gonna be more than one shot that they require from the day, right? So I actually like to group things together. So in this example, we have like the three images, my favorites from a shoot I did for National Geographic Channel's film, Killing Lincoln. Um, and then I have the three zombie boy images that you have below. So I'm displaying them in series to mix them up and put them in different parts of the book and be too dependent on color tone is gonna to be backward because we wanna also make sure that we're seeing things in series. So uh, when you look at any magazine, they'll have like the cover photo, right? It's a cover story. So you have like the base cover, you turn the magazine, you have the table of contents picture. Later on, flipping through the magazine, you find like the double page spread, right? And then maybe like some other vertical photos as you go. That's a photo story. That's how I work, is I get hired to do different image series. So again, in my portfolio, I'm gonna wanna replicate that and show maybe like three to four of each thing so it doesn't get too boring of like the same subject matter and we move on from there, okay? Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about, the other main pillar of a successful portfolio is that it's a conversation piece, okay? So basically, when I sit down and show someone my work, the worst thing that could ever happen is like complete silence. It's so awkward, right? When you're sitting there and like looking like, what is this guy thinking? Oh my God, he's like, mm -mm. like that's the worst. So I like to also structure my portfolio to be a conversation piece. And I know that if I can talk about my work as you turn the pages and there's never a dull moment, then that also means there's probably a pretty good order, right? So a conversation piece, what's gonna happen in a good conversation, uh, you're gonna start with something interesting, right? To talk to somebody. Approaching a girl at the bar, you don't wanna say like, how's the weather out? That's, that's, that's boring, right? <laughs> Approaching someone, right? You wanna start good, end good, but also keep it consistent throughout, okay? So um, for my portfolio speaking, uh, what I like to do is I like to start with something relevant, something new that I've shot that's not too old, uh, that maybe just passed. So in my work, for example, I have the Oscar nominee portrait. So something that just happened um, that some of my entertainment clients will appreciate. Uh, they're not my strongest portraits ever, but they are an interesting talking point because I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but those portraits were taken extremely fast. Like there's like no time at all. Unlimited time to pre-light and set the light, but in terms of my time with a celebrity, 
extremely fast. So to me, opening up the portfolio says something about that, right? So I can have something to actually talk about that they're familiar with. Then I can go on to like a little bit more obscure things and as long as there's an interesting story, we can carry on the conversation. Um, and then I like to end with a bang. So my portfolio used to have my personal travel work first because I didn't feel like my commission work was as strong. But nowadays I've been making um, a very hard push for shooting my commercial work the same as the personal stuff that I'm doing. And now that gap is being merged a little bit. Um, and what's happening is people are approaching me to shoot that style um, in a paid kind of gig. And it's the best of both worlds because I can be extremely creative, um, get exactly what they want out of the shoot, but kind of like merge the styles and have a very more cohesive theme through everything that I do. So. I like to talk about things. The other thing is since I'm ending in personal work, I can tell a travel story, right? And they're gonna remember me for that. Um, so yeah, so those are the pillars of what I feel makes a successful portfolio. Uh, I'm sure I've been rambling on, I see you guys like scribbling notes. So let's pause for a minute before I go on and talk about ex um, specifically the personal work that I'm doing and how that relates to the portfolio. And maybe we can have some questions based on what I just talked about. All right, Joey, first of all, I cannot tell you how engaged and active that the chat rooms are right now. We probably already have 50 plus questions going nice. on in here yeah. just about that segment. So right. it's fantastic. Thank you guys for being so engaged. But I do want to start with our studio audience here. And if anybody has a question here, we'll take that first or we'll go to the interwebs and just grab the mic, please. Yeah, Joey, you mentioned you have a selection process for picking the images for your current portfolio. Are you the only one that is part of the selection process or do you have oh. other photographers or friends involved? In? Cause Definitely, because as you know, like when you shoot something, like you're very biased toward it. I really like to get opinions from people who aren't photographers. Like for example, my dad, I can show him work and be like, what the hell, that's crap. But I'm like, no, but look at the depth of field, like look at the thing. Most people who experience my work aren't gonna be other photographers, right? So it is nice to get other people's perspectives. Also, I ask my agents, because they have a lot of experience, more time in the commercial world than I do, so they might think, oh, well, you know, this variation, or this shot is more relevant uh, to get, like, pitching for jobs, right? So they're a good opinion for me also. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it always comes back to intuition and gut feeling. Um, so I'm in control of like all my selections. I oversee everything from the final element, but I definitely do rely on other people because I'm, I'm sure you're the same. Like you do a shoot and like you have like three variations and like one, like their chin's up like this and one their chin's like down. My dad would be like, who cares, just pick one. <laughs> and we're like stressing over it. So for me, I like to get a taste of photographers, people in the industry, and also people who have nothing to do with photography just to see what image is the mo has the most impact. Is another question in, in studio? Yeah, my question, um, in, in specifically in terms of an online portfolio where mm -hmm. I'm looking at shooting both editorial and commercial work, mm -hmm. and my goal is to shoot more or less the same style but for two different types of clients. Do you have any suggestions for mixing those on a website? Should they be in the same portfolio? Is it better to do two, you know, like a, a portfolio of editorial and then commercial or more like a portfolio of mixed, but like here's portraits and here's mm. more documentary work? It's a great question, yeah. So what I recommend is um, almost the way that I, my website's structured because I do shoot um, ed ed editorial and advertising. I'm in the same kind of boat as what you're describing is um, for the main base, we'll call it like highlight section or a quick portfolio, right? That's where you can mix this stuff, okay? So you can mix it and then later on in your website in different sections, then you might choose to sort things by edit editorial and advertising um, with more content, so images that weren't in the quick portfolio. But can you make a, like the base book mix? Absolutely, because the things that are true to um, editorial are still very true to advertising. Um, what I do personally, is um, I have some ads in my book that have, um, that are the photography, but also like the title adds to it, or like the layout that the ad agency designs around the image. And if it's not distracting to my work, um, I'll actually incorporate those throughout the book, um, as long as it doesn't break up the flow. 
if it takes away too much from the photography, then I'll just put the photo in by itself, right? So on, even on my website, uh, if you go to joeyl.com right now, okay, for those interested watching, um, if you go through, I mixed in uh, the advertising with the entertainment, but I was staying true to the flow um, and to making things feel consistent. But um, as long as you already said, like you're just shooting similar subject matters, as long as it's together and feels cohesive, it's fine to mix the two. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, there are so many people having, that have great questions, but one that stands out to me is from Beauty of the Late, who is joining us from St. Pete, Florida. They ask, if you have a, a physical portfolio book, and if so, how do you display your images in it relation to using both vertical and horizontal images? Mm, good and question. And is it a printed book? And thank you. Yes, so... First question, the first version of that question, like the first part, is that in my portfolio, um, I think it takes away from the experience when people, like when you have to actually physically turn the book. So for example, if people are shooting like horizontals and it's laid like this, all right, and then you have a vertical and to turn it. I try to stay away from that um, because I think it does take away from the experience. Instead, uh, what I might do is incorporate like diptychs. So you have like two verticals together that go beside one another. And maybe on like the left page you have you know something long and wide, and then like on the other page you have like the vertical, so it doesn't feel like you're losing too much space in a horizontal book. Um, and what was the second part to that question? It was if it was a physical book that you mm -hmm. actually have. So physical books are being used less and less in the industry. Um, oftentimes in the past, if there was a job, what would happen was the client or whoever would call in a bunch of photographers' books um, and they would sift through them and kind of like feel, feel out who was right for the job, okay? So you'd actually physically mail your book in to do that. And it still happens. It's still um, very common. Uh, but nowadays, more and more what's happening is just website links, okay? Actually, it's easier because you don't have to pay postage, like worry when your book's coming back. Uh-oh, one gets damaged by FedEx or UPS. Oh, God, right? So it's easier to send links, okay? However, um, I think that the printed portfolio is an amazing piece to go in when you're meeting face-to-face -face meetings, right? Especially if, I'm, if you think about shooting for editorial or advertising, uh, we're shooting for a print medium. That's going to be the final output of what I'm working for, so I would choose to display what I would like to be hired for. So I'm shooting for print, I want to display in print. There's also something nice just about like turning pages. So I've kind of, um, what, the way that my book works is that it is like printed and it's set and I might change it and get it reprinted like once per year. But if I do have new work, I throw it on an iPad, right? So I'm not totally against like displaying things digitally. Um, what I'll do is like, it's really hard to print something I did last month or a couple weeks ago and get like the whole thing redone. It's very expensive. Um, so instead, I'll like put my new work on a laptop or an iPad and start off with that and be like, hey, I just finished this. I just finished the retouching or I just finished this one month ago. Um, and then after that, we'll go and look at the, the printed book. All right, I'm just going to take one more from the internet and then send it back over to our studio audience. And this question is from Addy Farr in England. What makes you pick a certain image to go th into your portfolio? Is it the way you make someone, some, is it? Is it the way it makes you feel, something that best represents your style, or something more of a technical aspect? And mm. it was also, so I wanted to ask that combined with, um, do you have different portfolios for different clients? Okay, so the first, the first question, um, uh, which I'm now forgetting, what, what was it? What makes you pick a certain image to go into okay, your yeah, portfolio? Yeah. Is okay. it style, <laughs> yeah. technical, okay, got something it. you feel? Yeah, brain fried, okay. so. Uh, the first part of that question is, um, am I basing my selection based on technique and technical elements or the performance of the subject? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, it's always more important the performance and, the, and how that makes you feel. Um, in the past, uh, when I was starting out, it was definitely more technical and I'd worry so much about, oh, is the light perfect in this shot versus this shot? But then like someone like my father would look at it and be like, oh, it's stupid. Right? He doesn't care if like the rim light's here. He doesn't care if like it's like perfect. So to me, um, I would rather get an engaging look yep. or an engaging expression and use something where I might have missed the focus a little bit. I'd rather have that okay. than something which is technically perfect. Um, however, if I have two selections that are kind of similar, of course, I'll choose the one which is like technically superior. 
Um, and the second, the second, second one was, do you have different portfolios yes. when you go talk to different clients? So, um, what's very interesting is I shoot a lot of entertainment and advertising, but then I also have um, clients who really like my personal work, right. right? So like the travel stuff. So I have two different versions of the same image selections. So mm. the same group of images, I have two different versions. Um, one is how it reflects online, which is the entertainment stuff first. And then the other one is the exact same image, except I put the personal stuff Got first, it. right? So. Uh, depending on who the client is or who the who I'm meeting, um, I will uh, I will choose to bring that specific order. Um, but the, the selections are exactly the same. So the reason why on my website I decided to put the entertainment stuff first um, is because the majority of people want to see that stuff first for me. Okay, great. And when you are building upon that, when you are thinking about that order, mm -hmm. uh, and can you talk again about do you start, have to start strong and end strong? Is there a middle strong? Like what is the kind of flow that you want when exactly. somebody is looking through? It has to be all killer, no filler, right? Nice. So obviously, <laughs> obviously there's gonna be images that are better than others, right? That's true to anybody. Um, but kind of what I was talking about in the conversation piece is like if you can keep it flowing throughout, and yes, you need to start strong, and yes, you need to end strong, but like the entire middle of the book can't be boring. Like, it can't be boring. So, uh, I, I try to keep it consistent, but I know, like I'm, I'm, I know when I look at my work, like what's better than others. So I just keep that in mind and like keep it spread out, because even if uh, you organize things into series, uh, if you organize things like three images at a time, there's going to be one that's better than, than the other. So I would just make sure like the start is good, and then the start is good of each three. So it's like, oh, okay, it feels like you're a little bit of a better photographer. <laughs> Awesome. And Shane, thank you very much for waiting, but you have a question. Yeah, actually, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, I was kind of interested to hear how much emphasis you actually do put on the technical. So if something is slightly out of focus, okay, you, you just mentioned something about that. But um, as far as even like photo competitions, I know they get really upset if there's like a clipped highlight somewhere or a, a crushed shadow or okay. something like that. How bent out of shape does an art director get just looking through a bunch of magazines? They're all, they're all kinds of slightly less technical photographs mm. out there. So what extent does that actually go to? As photographers, we're seeing things a lot differently than people who are, you know, in advertising or looking, you know, maybe not from a pers uh, f f photography perspective, but they're looking for different things. So, I mean, you mentioned photo competitions. There's so many <laughs> different ones. Some are like complete crap that are total scams, like, and other ones are like good, where they're actually relevant, right? Um, so for me, I would look at what criteria they're judging you for. Obviously, technical skill is extremely important. Like, photography is half science, half art, right? For me, when I'm shooting, uh, what I like to do is, you know, have all the lights set. When everything is ready to go, I'm working almost like a cinematographer, right? I don't want to touch anything when it's set, and I can just work with the subject. So tomorrow, when we actually do, like, location shooting here, um, you'll see, like I said, ev everything either with that model or with a test subject, get everything ready to go. And as I'm photographing, I'm like not even concentrating on light, especially with flash. I can't see it in the, fo fo in the viewfinder anyway. So I'm working with them making like the better performance. So when I started, way more technical, like worried about stuff. Nowadays, I've just been, been trying to focus on what is the most engaging expression. And does that change when you're obviously in the studio, you have a little more control, but when mm -hmm. you're outside doing stuff like that, then it can be a little more unpredictable. It's, I think, it's yeah. in every, every scenario. Yeah. It's, it's hard when you, um, when you travel, but the same, still the same rules up apply. So it just becomes more difficult, especially, you know, I photograph a lot of people, um, maybe that come from reality shows or someone who's not maybe necessarily a trained model. So you're going to have to work with them more to get the engaging expression. All right, Joey, well, we have so many fabulous questions again, but I think we can keep going. We still Let's have another uh, dedicated Q&A period at the end of the segment. So I know we have some more photographers work to see. Great. So the other area of the portfolio um, that I like to talk about is personal work. Okay, you'll see me use this term a lot. I'm a huge 
excuse me, I'm a huge advocate for what we call personal work. So again, like I defined portfolio, let me define what that means. Is I say personal work uh, for any photo shoot that I'm doing that I'm not being paid for, right? I'm just doing it for the love or for the experience or to build my portfolio. That's what I mean when I say personal work, okay? So for me, um, as you guys know, that's the stuff that I like to go out shoot and traveling, okay? This is something that uh, I get very excited about. It's something I do on my own time. It's sort of my hobby. Um, but of course, it does lead to commissioned work also. So people say, well, how do you finance these trips? How do you go on these things uh, when you're missing so much work back home? The thing is, is these personal shoots that I do help uh, my commission work, right? So it's kind of like, um, it's a healthy balance. Anything that I go spend out money doing myself that's financed um, can lead to commissions down the road, okay? So the first reason why I'm doing these shoots is like sometimes you might see me here like maybe getting a little hippie is obviously like because I like it, okay? I don't wanna live my life doing something that doesn't make me happy. I think it goes like, it needs a, uh, it needs a special mention in the creative field because like creative people can get depressed and get into slumps really easily. So if you're gonna dedicate you know, years to doing something, it better make you happy. So the first thing about personal work is the obvious pleasure, right? So I'm doing this just because I want to do it. I love traveling, okay? Um, no other craft other than photography can you meet somebody, be like, can I hang out with you all day and take photos and eat your food and like figure out stuff about you? Like you can't do that with any other uh, job, right? So it's, it's, it's an amazing thing and I do it just because I love it. Even if I wasn't a working photographer, I'd still like go out in photography, maybe stock some shelves back here, save up some money and still do this, okay? So it's the thing that keeps me passionate. Um, creative people, uh, I like to surround myself with passionate people. When I'm talking to somebody about their work, like I know when they are into it or not. Like their eyes light up, they start talking, oh, yeah, blah. like I love surrounding myself with those kind of people. And those are the people that I choose to work with. So first of all, personal work, it's the obvious pleasure, okay? The other important thing about setting up tests or setting up your own shoot, uh, which you might put in your portfolio later, um, is it helps you grow as a photographer, right? So let me give you an example. Um, is if I'm photographing a, a large body of work, right? And I want to get hired off of it. Typically, the clients that hire me don't want to take too much of a risk and hire a photographer who couldn't pull off their vision, right? So they want to hire someone they know can execute this portrait in that style that way, so they choose me, okay? Or they want to know a photographer who's worked with a similar subject, okay, that's how I'm getting hired. But let's think about what happens over time, okay? You get hired off of old work to kind of do what you've already done. You get hired off that again to do what you've already done. Uh, you can see kind of like a slump coming here, can't you, <laughs> right? You're doing, oh, I'm doing the same stuff I've been doing for years, right? That happens. So what the whole idea for personal work is to like get out of that slump and start experimenting because it's not on a commissioned commercial job that I want to like start messing around and because um, you know I have a responsibility to deliver images but what I can do is go off set off a test experiment mess it up doesn't matter all right and then later on I can apply those things to actual jobs and what I've learned and grow as a photographer okay so um, What's interesting is on the screen here is um, I was never like into shooting things a little lighter and like flaring the lens. This is something I just didn't know much about combining ambient light uh, with studio light. I started doing it a lot on my travels and I was like, oh, 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 okay. So later on when I had like History Channel stuff, I was like very comfortable with that kind of craft. So if you look at these two images side by side, they're both mine. Uh, stylistically, they're both very similar, but one is a commission job and other is something like I just did for fun, right? But they still fit in my book and they still both have merit and they still help, help each other out. So after a while, like, oh, that's a neat effect. I can do that for a while. Then I'll go on and try something new and experiment with something different. Um, let me give you a little backstory of where I came from is just shooting a lot of musicians, right? So like five dudes standing there like, mm. right? That's where I come from. That's built my first portfolio. So you can imagine what happened over time is that 
those bands saw me, similar bands would hire me, similar bands would hire me, and then all of a sudden I have a whole portfolio that doesn't have like a single woman in it, right? A single female in it. So what happens is, is people who hire me um, looking at that work might go, hmm, this photographer isn't used to working with female subjects, okay? Stylistically, he's on point. Technically, these portraits look good, but to photograph a girl in our culture is a little different, right? There's certain like things you have to do. The hair has to be a certain way, the clothing. It's like, you have to be tasteful, right? It's a lot, it's a, it's a lot different. So what I had to do is do personal work and test in order to prove uh, that I was capable of doing that kind of work. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting example uh, of a test shoot that I set up um, on my own dime, right? Just uh, approached a modeling agency and said, I'd love to test in exchange for a model of yours time. I can take really nice high quality images. She has benefit because she can use it for her portfolio. Me, same thing, I can use it for my photographer's portfolio. And you can get um, uh, a mutual exchange of services, right? So this is a, a test shoot that I set up just because I didn't have any women in my portfolio. Did this shoot, I did several others since then. It only took like three shoots to mix it into my portfolio. And all of a sudden, now I realize I'm not missing as many jobs that have women in it. People trust me to do this now because I had to prove myself. If I went to a meeting and just spoke about it, it means nothing. Instead, I have to like show it in my work, okay? Another important thing about personal work is that you want to break down barriers and be it not just about photography, but also say something about you, all right? So we're gonna get a little deep here, all right? So what I want people to do when they look at my work is yes, appreciate the photos, but also have that photo transcend just being a photograph, okay? I want them to learn something about me, about my personality and what I'm capable of. So let me give you a good example. As I talk about those rugged trips that I did in Indonesia or Southern Ethiopia, that was my personal work. When I sat down and showed History Channel that kind of photography, um, yes, they know like the lighting's good on other stuff that I've done, but it says something about me that I'm capable of working in this kind of environment, right? So when something comes up like Deadliest Roads, where these photographs are from, they think, hmm, Who's someone who can live like a complete scumbag for a couple months? And who's someone we can throw in like a dangerous situation where he might not come back from? Oh, Joey, perfect, right? So that has said something about me uh, as a photographer. And yes, they like my photographs, but would they trust someone who's like works in a comfortable studio all the time with that particular assignment? No, vice versa. Uh, if you had a book that was just all this stuff, would they trust you working in an environment somewhere else? No. So your photography should say something about you also. Uh, I have a friend named Scott Schaefer. Uh, in real life, uh, he's extremely quirky, okay? He's like a really funny guy. He's a great sense of humor. If you look through his portfolio, stylistically it's on point. It's very cohesive. But you can look at that and like you know he has a really good sense of humor. So would they hire some guy uh, who just has like a really kind of a dry book that's like very serious and very atmospheric to pull off a comedy movie poster? Maybe not. Although technically they might be the same. Uh, they'll want to work with someone like Scott because they, they know in order to execute that, he had to have a good sense of humor, right? I just want to make a comment, Joey. Yes. Uh, that Chase Jarvis is coming out uh, in, the, in our next segment. And it's the mm. same thing with Chase. If you look at his work, you look at his portfolio. Who can I get that can shoot from a helicopter and extreme sports and while skiing and not exactly. just him but his team? But you would imagine that he would definitely be showing that type of work to show what he's capable of doing. Yeah, because when you look at that stuff of like the skiers or like Chase's stuff of like the um, travelers and... Um, like extreme sports, like what exactly. you, you mentioned. Like I know a lot of people that couldn't do that. For example, like I couldn't because I can't snowboard or ski and there's like shots for like going down the mountain doing that. It's like, it's probably like not gonna be the best fit for me. So yes, anyone can photograph, you know, something in that environment, maybe light it. There's a lot of photographers who could do something similar. But what that says about him is that he's capable of doing it, exactly. So it's a working in two different ways. Right, cool, I hadn't thought about it that way, that's awesome. Well, 
that's part of what I'm here to do. <laughs> All right. So, the last thing uh, which is really important about your uh, including personal work into your portfolio is that it keeps you remembered, right? So, I work with a lot of people in advertising. They deal with ads all day long, right? It doesn't mean that they're not into it, but if I have these personal travel stories and these things that have happened to me, again, they'll transcend just the photograph and they'll be able to remember who it was that took that work, right? It's like the guy with the stupid haircut that I met like a couple weeks ago, like that guy. Hopefully they will remember me, all right? Because we have, in our industry, we have like a sea of photographers and you have to think about what separates them. At the end of the day, we can all grow and we can get so technically good and have a good body of work. But the thing which is gonna differentiate one from another uh, is how you remember them. So oftentimes, uh, jobs come up extremely quick, right? Um, they come up extremely fast and it might just be whoever the person like happens to remember being a good fit. So this goes back again uh, to having a very cohesive portfolio because someone who's kind of like a jack of all trades that shoots like this, 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 it's really hard to remember them for one specific thing. So if someone has a job come up where it's like environmental portrait and I want it to look like this and they've met me, I hope that they're going to remember that I am the one who can execute that and pull that off. Okay, so we're back to the Q&A screen. All right, fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful work, by the way, Joey. Thanks. Uh, let's start in our studio audience before we go to the internet. Let's see, go ahead. This question kind of goes back to uh, when you were talking about your digital portfolio and having a book. Something I like about having a book, um, it's something very tangible. It's more than just you know another picture on the internet. Exactly. Um, and, but in that, what kind of pictures do you put on, online and what kind of pictures do you put in your book? Are they the same? And yeah. So in the base portfolio, uh, they're the exact same selection, right? So on my website, uh, you'll see a quick portfolio section. That mimics the printed book. However, what you can't do in, in a book is have like the different series that I've done, right? I'm going to go through my website after, and I can show you uh, a visual of what I'm talking about. But um, to me, I think the book should mimic the website uh, very closely, because if you're presenting your work on the web, Right? What if they see that first, or what if they see the printed book first? I would like to see it match. Um, and also, just thinking off the top of my head, another thing is uh, similar branding. Right? So does the book have the same font you use on the, does it, on the web? Does it have the same color tones? All these things, I think, should be similar. Two parts. When you're sending a, <clears throat> like a, a link to a portfolio, mm -hmm. Is it better to have it, you know, when they click on that link, it's opening up to a single image that they're then going to go through, or is it better to have them open up to an index of images? Yeah. Both, because Both. it depends on how the website is designed, right? Okay. So when I do pull up my website, um, which I'll go through in a minute, it's like there is a large splash page, which kind of paints a picture of what I do. Uh, other friends and examples that I'll show later, um, it opens in the highlights gallery. So for me, it's a little tacky like sending like a really long link unless you're sending a link that has something specific for that client, right? So if there's a specific section that only relates to them, I would send them that link. But I would also think about how your website is sorted from the splash page. So how are people going to interpret the material and view your work just from like typing in your URL? And then I'll use me as an example. A lot of wedding work over the last few years and I want to you know focus on portrait work but a lot of my you know I use a lot of lighting when I do weddings and my favorite part of a wedding day is you know the portrait mm -hmm. and the bride and the groom and I you know some scenarios I have two or three lights set up and Got it's it. heart attack material but it I mean can I take that you know and try and restructure some of those it's some of my favorite work you know mm -hmm. a bride and, and try and restructure it into a portrait portfolio, you know, not, so if someone sees it, they're not going to see wedding photographer, but they're going to see portraits. Oh yeah, definitely. I can see your eyes lighting up. Like what I said, you're like, wow, I have lights in this. <laughs> so it seems to me like what you said, you're not into the, like, you do the reportage thing, but then you also are setting up portraits before of like the couple. Yeah. Yes. That can build a portrait portfolio. 
Uh, let me give you a good example from my work, is I was photographing a lot of bands and musicians, but it didn't necessarily mean that I just wanted to do like group shots of guys and bands. So what I was doing was giving them something different and unique that they would be stoked about and photographing them all individually. So I had these great locations, I had all the lights ready to go, a lot of interesting faces too, right, in the music industry. So I was using them kind of like as um, commercial subjects. And my first portfolio was just all musicians, uh, but they were individual portraits where they could be anybody, right? So when you looked at my first portfolio, it didn't necessarily mean that I only shot musicians. It was just like a bunch of interesting faces in different locations. So same thing for you as if you are getting the chance to photograph like these couple shots together, it might be a good basis to build a portfolio because you have all the lights set up, you have the situation, they're even like done up nice for their, their wedding day. So it might be a good place to launch off of. The internet actually has not stopped uh, asking you questions. So I'm going to throw out a couple more from the internet and then sure. we'll hand it back to our in-studio audience. Yeah. Uh, pro photographer asks, do you ever bring back old images back into your portfolio? And if so, why? Um, if I'm pitching for a specific job, okay, and say I'm sending them a PDF of my work, and something relates to them more uh, than what's displayed, I will have sort of like an archive that I can pull from. So let me give you an example. As if uh, a lot of the times for the entertainment shoots that I do, um, I am hired to do something on seamless, so like on a white background that they can use for syndication, and then I'm also hired to do in that same day uh, stuff that's on location, so on the set with a background like in an environment. So if I'm pitching for one of those jobs, I keep a lot of the studio stuff off my website because I think like if you've seen it once, it's there, like I can do it. But if I'm pitching for something like that, I might choose to pull from my archives like all the studio white backgrounds and just show them that as a body of work because that's, uh, I already know what the job needs, so I'll, I'll pull from old work for that. Anything else, not really, um, because I feel like old work is in the past and I'd rather pull from what I've learned from it to move forward. Right in the studio. <clears throat> hey Joey, um, so you were, <laughs> you were talking about um, <clears throat> building a brand <clears throat> and not being a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering, have you ever had a client approach you that wanted a style that's not represented in your portfolio and would you turn them out down or, or would you try to kind of give it a shot? Um, it has happened be before of people that I've already worked with, right? Because maybe they just like working with me on set and they're like, mm, I know it's like not really your thing, but like maybe we can do this. And I might do it just to keep the relationship good, right? Um, at the end of the day, I might not choose to display it because it could distract and it could keep away other things in the future. But uh, I'll do it if it's, if it's very interesting for me and if it's like creatively engaging, I can shoot it. Like I can shoot a lot of different styles but I would just be very careful putting it in the main body of work because then you might get into the thing with someone you're not used to working with looks at this, they don't know, am I going to get this or am I going to get this? So I'm shooting things that I'm not always displaying, but I am displaying the things that I think I'm best at. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, great. Maybe <laughs> uh, one more question before we move on. Uh -huh. And that is from Mark Zotrope in Chicago. You talked earlier about storytelling, creating a story, Joey. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by story? Pictures from one shoot, same setting, same mm. theme? Good question, because I should have defined that. Like I like to define my term. So when I say a photo story or photo series, um, they're all pictures from the same theme or same shoot. Okay. So it doesn't mean they're of the same subject. Um, it doesn't mean they're like all against the same wall or whatever, it's just something uh, that comes from that shoot. So, for example, Zombie Boy, right? We looked at those photos, yep. we're familiar with them now. I would say the story is, is how like, his skull face can be uh, examined in many different ways. That's kind of like the theme of that shoot. He obviously has like a tattooed face, okay? And then we have like the human bodies which make the human skull. We have the uh, memento mori, like uh, skull in the corner. So when you look through those three images, uh, they're not all exactly the same, uh, but they do kind of tell the story of what we're trying to accomplish there. Um, if you look at any magazine, uh, there's, uh, there's usually a, like a theme throughout all the photos, but they don't all look exactly the same. Perfect, thank you for clarifying. So I know we have several photographers to dissect, so if we can keep going, we've got about half an hour left. 
Exactly. So we talked a lot about different portfolios, uh, but now I'd like to show you through mine first, and then also uh, some friends of mine that I think are doing things right. Okay. So um, for those who want to follow along online, it's joeyl.com. Okay. Um, just I was with your question. I think we were talking about like the main splash page. So this is uh, when someone types in in their browser, joeyl.com. Uh, they're given like this main splash image, and I like to change this uh, based on new images that I release, right? So this is something that I just wrote a blog post for. Uh, it's new work that's a few months old, and I just finished retouching it. So I'm going to make the splash page of my image that, so that people know like there's something new, right? So whether they can find it on my blog, uh, or whether they can go into the sections and find it, they at least know something's new. So. Um, Paying attention to how my site is structured, you'll see the top nav bar. Uh, there's three main options for photography sections. <coughs> Thanks. Um, there's a quick portfolio, uh, which I was talking about, like, like the highlight section. Um, there's the personal commissions and videos, okay? But only the personal and commissions and quick portfolio is photography. So I've broken it down in those ways to kind of like segregate the work and as a way of organizing it. So the quick portfolio, um, this is what happens. We're not on the internet right now in case I type in and Google like says something embarrassing, right? So we're on the slideshow, uh, like my past search history, right? So um, we're in quick portfolio now. And this is what looks like, this is like when people click that and they want to experience my work, right? They're given kind of an example. Right away looking from that, we know like I'm a portrait photographer. We can look at the style and say, okay, it's a little cinematic, it's lit, it's a bit of a contrived style. So that might relate to somebody or not. We might turn away a lot of people, but we might really win over the people who actually might want to hire me that I care about to work for, okay? So going through uh, that first section, uh, you can scroll down, it looks like this. I have a lot of different commission work, but what I'm trying to do is transition to the personal shoots that I do, right? So it would, like what I was talking about at the starting, it'd be really hard to follow up um, some of the personal stuff with a more celebrity to mix and match. It might be a little jarring. So instead, if you look what I do on the bottom row, um, the bottom four images, I traveled with my friend Ryan, and I just took photos of him traveling in India as a test. The final goal uh, might be some advertising campaigns, right? Maybe an uh, airline, maybe... Um, uh, there's a lot of different uses for this kind of work, maybe in pharmaceutical, I don't know. But it's in my portfolio, and after those images are shown, then it's easier to transition to my personal work shot in India, right? And as you go through, looking at the India stuff, it's easier to transition to what I shot in Africa, because stylistically it's very similar. Um, but we go through that quick portfolio, and you're given the thumbs, and that kind of gives a sense of cohesion to what I do. If you were to click on one of the images, uh, it opens up larger. Um, I'm a big fan of putting a small text caption. I know some photographers are for it, some are against it. For me, I like to give a little bit of context to the image. So some are really simple, like this one of Robert De Niro. It just says, portrait of Robert De Niro, actor. Half of that is to help uh, search engines find the images. Even this JPEG is named like Robert underscore D underscore Nero so that Google can index it and you can properly find it. And the other thing is I just think it's nice because if you meet subject matters you're not familiar with, right? You meet people who you don't know, um, then you can give like a little bit about their story. And to me that paints a much nicer picture behind the image. So I like to include a little bit of text as well. So that was talking about the quick portfolio, but I love to shoot things in series or stories. So following the nav bar on the top of my website, if you click personal, then you can see six personal uh, series that are ongoing, right? These are uh, areas of the world where I've been and some of them multiple times, and I keep adding to these sections. Um, but these give an, a greater depth, excuse me, they give a greater look at those images. So in the quick portfolio, I might have chosen three or four from each section. So if you're really interested and want to look longer, you can go to personal and see like there's maybe 60 images in some of these galleries, but by then I kind of realize, okay, you've seen the quick portfolio, they want to see more. So for me, there's not really a rule of thumb of how many images to display afterwards. I figure as long as you like keep the crap out, it's good, okay? 
Similar, I have in uh, commissions, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, the main sections are celebrity and entertainment, and there's another section called advertising. Um, but you also see two case studies there, okay? The goal for that is I like to show the variety of what I shoot uh, on location and what I shoot when I'm given an assignment. So if you look at those advertising uh, sections, um, we can see a lot of my work with ads and layouts, but the case studies look like this. Um, they're that entire shoot, and I've only, focused to choose, uh, I've only chosen to focus on two in particular of recent things. The one is Deadliest Roads, the other is For Killing Lincoln. And that's more just to show people the scope of what I can get on one day, right? So we look through that and it's like, you can see there's like the first movie poster there and then you see like the first three images are different like posing variations. Um, clients know that my assignment was just, just to get one of those, but they can see at least I was like creative to like mess around, play with their idea a little bit. Because at the end of the day, what is someone hiring you for? Yes, they want you to pull off their vision, but they also want you to add something personal to it, right? So I hope someone looking through this section um, will go through it and be like, oh, Joey gets a lot of variation. He can think on his toes fast and uh, come up with something maybe even better than we initially thought. So if you were to click on some of these images, they're nice, but I don't think they're as strong as what I've chosen for the quick portfolio. Um, but just because they're there, um, they're in a different section, you can click through it as a case study. You want to experience that way anyway. So I'm okay with that. The other thing uh, that I've gotten really active about on my website is my blog. Uh, sharing behind the scenes stories of things that I've done in the past um, is used to, like, I used to kind of try to keep it separate from my clients, maybe even didn't mention it when I was in meetings. Um, but what I actually found recently is that people like it. They like if you approach them and do it respectfully before the shoot. People like seeing like a behind the scenes look at what happened, as long as you're being careful to get people's permission to post that. It's usually a good thing. Um, for me, it helps a lot. This is why you're here, right? Because you follow me as a photographer. So it's mostly photographers reading this. But you have to look at it from an advertising perspective. If someone hired me for a job, they look at me, they see a consistent brand, they see me writing about things from a photographer's perspective, they think, hmm, maybe this photographer also understands advertising and branding if he can brand himself. Okay? So the only thing I can actually write about in depth is photography because it's kind of like all I care about. So that's, <laughs> that's what my blog is about, but at least it's consistent. Um, and for any of those uh, people who are tuning in who haven't been to my blog, it's joeyl.com slash blog. Uh, you'll find a lot of behind the scenes videos and a lot of behind the scenes lighting diagrams and things like that. But it's nice because I speak to one area of the industry which is like photographers, but I'm also very active working and actually getting jobs. So the blog is for that side, okay? okay so this is a good friend of mine. Uh, his name's uh, Cody Tarr. Uh, the reason why I like to show him as the first example, uh, who's not me, is because he's someone that took it upon himself to start testing. And if, we, me and Jesse were just talking about this, um, a few years ago, Cody was like good, but not an amazing photographer, but he had potential. But like in the past year, he just started like unleashing, and for some reason something clicked, and all of his work is like really, really good now. And he's someone that just came from testing, right? He had no clients. He thought, I'm gonna have to prove myself somehow. So he started setting up tests, and now he's getting hired based on that body of work. Um, if you look through his portfolio, there might be things in there that certainly look commissioned. It's not. Some of it is, some of it isn't. But the truth of the matter is someone can look through his book and the photo's good or it's not. So it really doesn't matter. If he's had clients before, this is how to start out and how to get them. So Cody's website, um, you can maybe see a little bit of my influence, right? He's got like the quick portfolio there. I'm not the first one to come up with, with it, but he's might have uh, organized things the way I have. But he's got a quick portfolio, um, which is the first selection of his work. It's the strongest images. And then he breaks it down into three different categories, light, dark, and adventure. Something different for me, but that's all the different subject matter that he shoots. So. Speaking personally about Cody, uh, he loves sports, he loves outdoors, uh, something he knows a lot about. I couldn't name you one sports player ever. Like, I don't even, you can see it, I'm even unfamiliar with the term sports player. 
How was the match? I, like, I couldn't name you one, but he's chosen an area, uh, what he knows a lot about, what he's passionate about, to at least start out. So the area of the market that he's kind of trying to target is like sports, lifestyle, maybe like an ESPN type magazine, right? He'll start off that way. Doesn't mean that he can't shoot other things in the future. It doesn't mean like this can't just translate to portraiture or other adventurous things. But at least now when you think of sports, like you think of Cody, right? So for example, the first images that he has in this portfolio was actually for Gatorade. And uh, he had a friend of his who was a photographer who couldn't do an assignment. And he had to like back out and hire someone. So just being affiliated with sports at that point got him that job, okay? The other thing uh, that's interesting about Cody's work is you can see the light, the dark, and the adventure stuff even in this base, like quick portfolio selection, right? It starts off with the darker stuff, goes to light, and then he has adventure. So if you look at this thumbnail gallery, um, it looks like the last image of the guy running, if that were to follow directly, like the Gatorade thing, it might feel a little bit broken up. So the order in which he's choose to display things is nice because there's enough variation and you're not seeing the same thing over and over again, but he has been very uh, um, adamant about separating it, right? So let's flip through his website now. I don't know if it's crashed yet or not, but going through, okay. He starts off with his portfolio. A lot of these are tests. Uh, this is an Olympic athlete uh, that he was doing tests for with a modeling agency, like just doing other girls, and then they started representing her. They came to him, hey, do you want to photograph an Olympic athlete? He goes, hmm, fine, because it gives value to his work. So this is a test he set up. He made her come out at four in the morning, sit on a dock to get this portrait but it's helping her because it's helping her portfolio. She'll have many uses for this and it's helping him because he has an Olympic athlete in his book now, right? So it doesn't matter if that was set up by himself. It doesn't matter if uh, someone paid him to do it. Fact of the matter is the picture is going to be the same either way. There it is. Excuse me, and just one uh, um, note from the internet. Quite a few of our internet audience right now, they are just starting out, they're beginners, and mm -hmm. they're not quite grasping what a test is. Can you um, oh, elaborate on that? Define test. Yeah. Right. When I say test, I'm describing, for those who just tuned in, describing something that you set up by yourself, right? So it's not a job you were paid to do. It's something that you actively went out and set up. You sourced the models, you found the location, you set up to test, to add into your portfolio, to build value, right? So those who are starting out, you can't get jobs off nothing, right? You can't just be, hey, I'm going to be a ph ph photographer. Why isn't anyone hiring me? Right? You got to test in order to build a first body of work and then get hired off those tests. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So, uh, looking through Cody's work, he has more tests. Um, he's a big fan of not getting permits and just shooting things really early in the morning where people are too tired to care. Right? So this is like a great location. I think it's in New York City. Yeah. Um, and he just set it up, right? set up his lighting, right? I find, think he found the runner off maybe like Model Mayhem or something, or maybe a modeling agency for sports. And he just set it up, but it looks good enough that it could have been a commission or it could have been part of a story on this runner in something like ESPN, right? You don't know that looking through it. Um, going back to his website, if we want to look at some of the lighter work now, uh, stylistically, it's a lot different, but I think the subject matter is very similar, so it still fits in. Because if we have a story for a magazine, it's like sometimes you might have a portrait of the athlete, and then you might have like some action shots of them actually like running and doing things, right? So at least he's still incorporating that in his portfolio, and he's not being too specific. He's not being too specific to not include it, but still general enough that it still fits a sort of cohesive feel. Um, going back, this is his uh, quick portfolio again, but if you click the other options on the left side, you know, we're in light here. Uh, there's certain images that didn't quite make it to his quick portfolio, um, but if someone liked his work and they wanted to say, ah, oh, we're hiring him to do something light, they can click that and see more variety and more options. Exact same thing uh, for dark. There's some things that didn't quite make the cut for the main selection, but he has more below it. Um, if I could give Cody one piece of feedback while I'm here, as I see he's starting off his dark section with the same image he's starting off his quick portfolio, I'd actually change it up a little bit so that he's starting with something different because if they're getting there, the splash page, they've already seen that image. So it's important to show, but I might put something else first. That's one 
feedback, little nitpick that I have. Hope he's watching now. Um, looking through even more to adventure, that's how he's sort of isolating these different subject matters and isolating the people who are like in their environment. Okay, let's crash somebody else's website. This is a friend of mine called Nick Onkin. Okay, um, the reason why I'm really drawn to Nick's work uh, is because he shoots a completely different style than I do. So if someone shoots something similar, I'm like, ah, God, crap, rip off artists trying to steal from me. So I'm drawn to people who shoot things differently just because of that, right? So I love Nick's work. I think he understands light extremely well because he can make these kind of like scenarios that feel very real and feel very raw and natural, but the lighting's still beautiful. So his whole thing is like, he likes to make things look a little bit snapshotty, but, and not too constructed, but you know there's like a whole thought process going on in these kind of lighting setups. Like you know he's thinking about lighting and thinking about doing things, um, but it doesn't appear that way on camera. So he works a lot uh, for like lifestyle campaigns and advertising editorials that focus more on that style of work, right? And flipping through his portfolio, you see there's a sense of cohesion through it. It looks as if it was all from the same hand. Even going to like black and white, he has a black and white section in his book where he hasn't really broken it up be between, because it might feel a little weird to just snap to a black and white image and then color and go back and forth. He's kind of put like these as a series together, right? So when you flip through his work, black and white or not, it feels like it comes from the same hand. He has a very cohesive style. Another interesting thing uh, that I really like about Nick's website um, is you might see down below in the slide in the bottom right corner, uh, if you hover your mouse over it, he has an option to add images to light boxes. And that's because a lot of his clients are making things called mood boards. What this is, is if you're putting a shoot together, you might reference a lot of different photographers and put their images together and sort of like say, I want my shoot to feel like these images all together, right? So he's allowing people to pluck images from his website using a light box and use them as reference, hoping that they'll actually hire him to do that since the reference comes from him. So and it's a nice piece of coding, but if you hover and like add things to Lightbox, what happens is you can choose just to display those images only, and you can actually export a PDF directly from his website that only has your selections in it. So he's saying, here's my work, pick and choose what you want, and then hopefully that'll help me get the job later. Um, something that's really nice, another little hidden gem in Nick's website, is you'll look that when you open an image and download it, on the website it doesn't display with a watermark, right? It just says there's the picture, there's nothing distracting, but if you do add it to a light box and if you do download it, some engine automatically puts in his watermark over the image. So it's a really nice feature because let's suppose someone makes a mood board to get inspiration for a kind of shoot and they're like, oh man, who is that guy that did all these good pictures? At least his name's like right there, right? So it's a good example of a very well-designed portfolio. I'm going to give you one more site to crash uh, before I move on. Uh, this is a, another friend of mine named Sam Spratt. And what's interesting about Sam Spratt, uh, his website is samspratt.com for those who want to crash it out there. Um, what's interesting about him is he's not a photographer at all. But the same rules apply to his portfolio even though he's a painter. Right? So he paints this super realistic, um, extremely photorealistic, but still like fine artist brushstroke style. Um, and he organizes his website in a very similar way to what I recommend for photographers. So if you first go to the page, uh, go to his website, it opens up with a highlight section. This is the same thing as like a quick portfolio. He calls it highlights. And he chooses um, images of his work, uh, which are new and relevant to display first, but also his best work, right? So he kind of like filters out. He does something interesting where um, on the left he displays the full image, and on the right he shows a close-up. And that's just because for his own clients, he's a painter. So he wants to show like the actual detail that he's able to get with brush strokes, right? So that is true to him. Um, looking through his work, uh, it is extremely cohesive uh, because they're all paintings. So he probably has to rely less on organizing things through color tone because he just has a style, no matter what he paints, it kind of looks like it came from Sam Spratt, 
right? So we always joke, me and him, it's like, oh, Sam, you have it so easy. If you want an environment, you can just create it. You can just like brush it in there. You don't have to like hire all this stuff. You don't have to light it, blah, blah, blah. And he says, yeah, but Joey, you can just go there and like take a picture and your like job's done. So we kind of have like equal, equal amounts of work going into what we do. Uh, some of you might recognize this poster, right? It's for the uh, personal film project that I'm going to be working on. Sam was nice enough to design some of the early concept art for it. Um, he does a lot of celebrity portraiture, right? He doesn't have to get them to sit for a painting. He can pull a variety of different references to understand how their face looks. And he can do commissions, or he can do personal work, and you're never going to really know the difference, okay? So um, looking through his site, everything looks cohesive and good, and we're still in the highlight section now. But if you came across something and you're like, oh, look at this Angry Birds paintings, this is good, he's going to choose his best three for the highlight section. But really, he did a whole series uh, for Angry Birds, right? So if you click on Gallery uh, at the top, you can find the different sections in which he's chosen to have separate case studies. So clicking on Gallery, going to Angry Birds, he chose the, his best three for the main selection. But then he went in depth and showed every single one um, in this gallery by itself. Because if I was interested to hire him for this kind of work, right, at least I could see the variety. But this might be a little bit too much to show in the base highlight section. And back to the Q&A. That's it. Great examples from your friends. I love the diversity that you showed uh, between you know just uh, painters and photographers. Very very cool. There are. Tons and tons of questions from the internet, but first we're going to start in the studio audience here because I know you guys have questions as well. Do you ever include, is it a no-no to include like anything from the environment? So let's say I have a portrait set up and then I have a few shots that are, you know, good portrait shots and then I have like something from that environment that's not a portrait. Mm -hmm. Should I completely leave that out? No, uh, give me an example, because uh, it's, uh, it could be yes or it could be, be no. It's, it's kind of a case-by-case case So I have a, a set up a lighting scenario and they're playing shuffleboard. Mm -hmm. So I have some cool shots of that. But then there's one shot with the exact same lighting that I got of, you know, the, the puck going the off and landing mm -hmm. into the salt and the salt's exploding. It's a really cool mm -hmm. picture, but... So what you would have to do is sort of determine uh, what is the goal in what you're uh, going for, right? So if you're shooting for, like, let's say shuffleboard, the first thing that comes to mind is like a travel and leisure magazine. We're going on holiday, play some shuffleboard, right? For them, uh, something like that would be very relevant, right? Because in their magazine, I know how those look, right? Where you flip the page and they do have detail shots, especially, let's say, a hotel that had a shuffleboard court hired you they want these kind of detail shots and the people playing. So I think it's a great way uh, to show a story is uh, actually different close-ups. Um, for me, it has less relevance uh, because what I, I don't really do detail shots that much, um, and I mainly just focus on portraiture and ads. Um, but to tell a story, uh, you might need close-up things. And you, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's good. Simple answer, yes. <laughs> This is kind of a more of a background question, but um, how important is attribution in uh, online galleries? I mean, do you need to attribute like makeup artists or others who are involved, maybe conceptually? Oh, crediting or? things? Yes. Yeah, so what I like to do uh, is in my sections, the reason why I like to have text as well is because I can do things like that. So for example, those National Geographic images, like I was one piece of a very large puzzle. There was a lot of people who collaborated on that. So I'll say you know, what the production company was, or at least what the client was, like National Geographic Channel. I don't like to clutter up too much with credits from everything. Uh, where I might do that is in the blog post. So I actually wrote a blog post um, where I compared like, the test subjects to the actual subjects of Killing Lincoln, where it was like the people like, standing in for like, test shots. And um, in that post, I gave a shout out to everyone involved. I even mentioned how a lot of the creative concepts weren't mine. Uh, they were the creative director, Andy Baker's. And um, in that context, I'm writing a lot. But like beside a picture, I don't feel it's necessary to give out like, every single credit as long as you do it at, at some point. Especially remember that I'm working uh, a lot of tests. Uh, sometimes makeup artists are coming out for nothing, right? And they're just doing it for the shot. So I'm making sure that I at least give them the high resolution images to work from. 
and a shout out like for coming to help out. So hopefully they'll get hired off it and hopefully they'll get work and it was worth their time getting the image, but also they need to have a roof over their head too, right? Hey Joey, question yeah. from Fashion TV in Singapore, uh, which is one of our regulars here at Creative Live oh, that nice. joins in. Uh, when you mentioned to be remembered, in mm -hmm. your opinion, what should be best? What should we be best remembered for? You mentioned earlier feel over technical competence for portfolio images. For example, uh, working attitude or technical competence, or the feel of the overall image. So what is, I don't understand what the, what the question when is. When you mentioned earlier uh, to be remembered mm -hmm. in your portfolio, in your opinion, what should we be best remembered for? Okay, yeah, I think um, choosing individual images, you obviously want to choose the most engaging one, but what I mean by being remembered is being remembered for uh, the style in which you shoot or the subject matter that you choose to shoot, so that if someone has a job uh, that reflects that and that becomes necessary, that's what you become remembered for. So I think the subjects become more remembered for how they look in the photo. That's not necessarily me, right? It is me taking a photo of them, but that's for them. But what I meant was, is like remember how you shot that and how you executed that as a photographer. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, Joey, well, it's time for our first 15 minute break. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what we're gonna do when we come back? Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Chase is going to come out and we're going to have some uh, talk about the industry and where we're headed. <laughs> 